This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, the May U.S. jobs report offers a mixed picture of the labor market. How dangerous is the shortage of skilled workers? Plus, Walmart is upping its game in its retail rivalry with Amazon. We head to Fayetteville, Arkansas, where thousands of Walmart shareholders have gathered at the annual meeting. And we take a look at the week that was and the major tech backlash facing the White House after President Trump withdraws from the Paris Climate Agreement. But first, to our lead. The U.S. jobs report added 138,000 jobs in May, the labor market giving mixed signals, the unemployment rate declining to a 16-year low, contrasted with hiring and wage growth that fell behind economists' consensus. Bigger picture, the data could indicate increasing challenges to find and hire skilled workers in the United States. Still, Gary Cohn, director of President Trump's National Economic Council, spoke to Bloomberg from the White House and touted the results. Since inauguration day, the U6 rate is down 1%. We've all, we brought back over close to 200,000 people that were sort of dis, dissatisfied or underemployed in the, in the U.S. workforce. That to us is a really amazing trend. So there is some very, very good news in this labor report. Here to break it all down, we're joined by Corey Johnson, our Bloomberg editor at large, and in New York, Jake Schwartz, CEO of General Assembly, a firm that works to train and place people in skilled jobs. Backers of General Assembly include Howard Schultz, Yuri Milner, Jeff Bezos. Um, Jake, let's start with you. What's your reaction to the report overall? On the one hand, it's as good as it gets. On the other, there are some mixed signs. Yeah, I think mixed signs is right, and I think it really points to a duality that we're seeing in this economy. Um, on one hand, um, as we can see, the unemployment rate is, is at a, a impressive low, and yet um, we're not adding jobs as fast as people thought we were going to. And I think the reality is, and, 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 and there's another sort of stat that is not in there, which is that we have um, an incredible number of outstanding job requirements out there in the market that are going unfilled. Um, and, and you hear constantly from employers about the, the troubles and the expense that they are, um, they are facing in, in order to fill their skilled, skilled jobs. And uh, what it really seems to be is that there's this, this incredible um, sort of tension between the overall sort of job economy and the skilled job, job economy. And what's I think more compelling about this is over the next 10 years, what we're going to see is more and more jobs, every job, frontline workers all the way up through managers, are, are going, they're going to have jobs that look a lot more like tech jobs, whether it's about dealing with big sets of data, whether it's about actually writing lines of code, or engaging in AI and machine learning. And so, you know, at GA, we are spending a lot of our time working with large companies, um, you know, major members of the Fortune 500, um, talking to them a lot about new ways of investing in their existing employees, as well as finding innovative ways to sort of disrupt their traditional recruiting and staffing models of, of solving um, skills gaps, and instead working to, to train and source the right talent for, for the coming shifts. Corey, obviously technology is changing the job market dramatically. Yeah. At the same time, you have tech CEOs like IBM's Ginny Rometty saying they're going to add thousands of jobs. How does it all balance out? Well, I, you know, there's certainly a, a, a general assembly is all about that, right? This sort of matching the skills gap. But uh, in this employment report, it was kind of interesting that uh, the computer uh, systems, which is one of the categories that uh, the Labor Department gives us, actually saw zero growth of jobs in the, in the most recent month. And that the, the, the place in the margins where this economy is going to add jobs really can only be in, in manufacturing more than anything else, and maybe some in retail. That, that adding jobs in the computer sector of the, of, the, of, 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 uh, the employment picture is actually harder and takes longer. Those jobs Jobs also tend to be jobs that people tend to keep. There hasn't been a lot of job hopping uh, as there had been in the past. And that was one of the reasons that today's report had zero growth in computer jobs. Jake, what would you say in terms of fields and jobs, which, which jobs are the hardest to fill? Well, you know, we are hearing a, a ton of challenges um, from our employer partners. Um, you know, one of the biggest and the most explosive is data, data science, data analytics. 
um, you know, um, thanks to our friends at, at, at Burning Glass, um, you know, we've seen that uh, the statistics that say that, you know, data jobs have essentially tripled over the last um, three years. Um, more importantly, I think there, there are estimates that, you know, in the next five years, we're going to end up with a $1.5 million, uh, some not million dollar, million person deficit of managers and analysts who are trained and able to deal with the large data sets that most companies are planning to rely on as part of their competitive advantages. So data is a big one. Um, you know, obviously anything related to web development, mobile development, um, software engineering, um, and then there's also other other interesting niche areas, um, UX design. Um, you're seeing um, a lot of stories about companies reducing the ratio of engineers to designers on, on product teams, and that's going to lead to an increase in demand for designers. Um, you know, digital marketing, uh, marketing as a field has gone through an incredible shift um, from being a primarily qualitative exercise to being extensively quantitative, um, and that's going to involve a huge pressure to find people with those quantitative skill sets, uh, which again calls all, comes all the way back around to data. Corey, how does what's going on in the U.S. compare to what's happening globally? Um, the employment picture here has just been very, very strong for a very long time. And, and the shift in employment, you know, you mentioned IBM. IBM is actually shrinking its workforce, even though they're putting up press releases about hiring people. But, uh, but you see a lot of movement into all, all sectors of the economy, and it's getting harder and harder to find jobs. One of the interesting stories we actually had in the Bloomberg last week is an interesting story that said that uh, company, even, even people with uh, conviction records, right, arrests and conviction records, uh, 70 million Americans, as many Americans have been in prison or been arrested as have been to college. And those people are actually finding jobs right now. So the availability of workers is actually getting to be a problem in the economy. Jake, President Trump is touting job creation. Have we actually seen jobs created? Does it appear that we will see jobs created? Well, I mean, that's a pretty hard, hard thing to talk about because, you know, we have seen actual job growth and a, and a decrease in the unemployment rate over the last six, seven, eight years, um, you know, really coming out of the Great Recession of 2008 and 2009. Um, so I think, you know, it's May right now. He came in an office in January. Um, typically, um, the things that an administration has its in power to do, um, there's typically a longer lag than that in order, in order to get the economy really uh, responding to anything that the executive branch of our government can do. Well, and, and to that, you know, it's, it's, Donald Trump has inherited a very d a tough act to follow with the big nut job numbers the Obama administration has put up, and it's going to be really hard to add those numbers. But manufacturing is actually the part of the economy where he's maybe most likely to have some input. What about retail? We saw 6,100 people lose their jobs there. Um, are those jobs moving to e-commerce, or are they just Absolutely. going away? Absolutely. So the retail uh, environment has been a disaster these last few months, and it's because Amazon, more than anybody else, is really sucking up a lot of things that were happening at the retail level. Shopping malls are having a very rough time of it. You saw bad results from Zoomies, for example, uh, today. Uh, the stock collapsing today, and you see that those uh, repeat, wash, rinse, repeat, pick, just fill in the plank, and you see really bad results uh, from all the major retailers out there. All right, Corey Johnson, our editor at large. Jake Schwartz, General Assembly CEO with us in New York. Jake, thanks so much for joining us. A story we are watching, Spotify has rushed to assure investors that plans to go public are still on track. Speaking on Swedish radio, the co-founder of the streaming music service, Martin Lawrenson, said the company doesn't need any money and an IBO isn't on the agenda. Spotify says Lawrenson isn't a spokesperson for the company and a public listing remains an option. The company has raised more than $1.5 billion in the private market and has about 50 million paying subscribers. Coming up, we head to Fayetteville, Arkansas, where thousands of Walmart shareholders have gathered at the annual meeting. We'll look at how the retailer is stacking up against e-commerce rival Amazon. And Bloomberg Tech is live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV weekdays, 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg. A stock we are watching, Broadcom, soared the most in a year, more than a year, after delivering an optimistic sales outlook. The chipmaker's rapid expansion has made its earnings an indicator of demand across the communications industry. Its chips perform key functions in connecting phones and running the infrastructure that directs traffic across the Internet. Broadcom chips are used in Apple and Samsung smartphones. 
Walmart is sharing the spotlight with Amazon at its annual shareholder meeting. The world's biggest retailer is charting its course of action to take on Amazon by becoming more like the e-commerce rival. I think that two-day free shipping on millions of items that will grow over time is a compelling customer offer. I don't think you should have to pay for shipping. With a membership <laughs> fee. <laughs> this comes just one day after Walmart announced a program that sends store employees to deliver online orders at the end of their shifts. Bloomberg's Emma Chandra was at the shareholder meeting in Arkansas and spoke to my colleagues Mark Barton and Vonnie Quinn a bit earlier. Amazon is really the big competitor now for Walmart as it's ramped up its e-commerce offerings. You mentioned they announced uh, a new program yesterday which is going to try and have uh, store employees uh, deliver the final mile for online deliveries. They've also been, uh, they've lowered the threshold for free delivery on online orders down to $35. Uh, and actually Amazon uh, matched that, which is something that is unusual for them, for them to do. Uh, this has all been uh, happening over the last year. So it's a very different situation from the shareholders meeting last year. This is after they acquired Jet.com. They paid $3.3 billion for that. And, uh, and that's the founder of Jet.com, Mark Laurie, came with that. He's now runs the whole of Walmart e-commerce. Uh, e and he's really been spearheading uh, this move to improve e-commerce for Walmart and take on Amazon. The, the brick and mortar experience uh, is being tweaked, isn't it, Emma? I mean, the brick and mortar store's growth has been a little bit more measured. What are they doing to improve that experience of going into the brick and mortar stores? That's really interesting, Mark, because actually I was talking to an investor yesterday who said, you know, the Walmart uh, experience is not all about Amazon. It doesn't need Amazon to fail for Walmart to succeed. Actually, more important for Walmart in a way is that other retailers are doing badly. And so they want to look, they want to see that Walmart is making the most of its brick and mortar, um, its brick and mortar stores. They've got 4,700 here in the U.S. They've got over a million employees and they've been really focusing on better training for employees, cleaning up stores making sure they have higher quality and more diversified products um, and they've also really been focusing on grocery they see that as a great way to get people into the store it's 50 percent of their sales and they feel that they can leverage both brick and mortar stores and online in grocery as they've introduced things like click and collect which seems to be very popular walmart tells us among families Yes, and of course, Amazon does have a little bit of time on Walmart because it's been delivering for a long time, Emma, but maybe, you know, Walmart can have the edge when it comes to produce and, and groceries eventually. But I do want to ask you about upping minimum wage in certain areas because that was a problem for Walmart when it was taking a charge for that. What is the company saying about wage growth now? So uh, as you may remember last year, Vonnie, they, um, improved, they made a commitment to boost wages for all their employees in stores. That's been seen as a, a good move. It's been uh, taken uh, in a good, positive manner by investors. We haven't heard anything else today about what they might do to improve those again. But we obviously had the jobs report today, and it shows further labor market tightening. And for a big employer like Walmart, that's obviously got to be something that they're going to be thinking about. That was Bloomberg's Emma Chandra reporting earlier from Walmart's annual meeting on Bloomberg Markets. In the auto space, Tesla has been a standout this year, eclipsing General Motors in market cap. But should investors be betting on the promise of Tesla's future compared to the current state of GM? David Einhorn, co-founder and president of Greenlight Capital, spoke earlier on Bloomberg Daybreak Americas about shorting Tesla stock, which he thinks is in a bubble. There you have a guy who's done all kinds of fancy innovation and, and is thinking about how society should be 50 years from now, 100 years from now, but he's yet to actually take any money and turn it into a profitable business. And I, and I don't have any optimism that that will change. Well, you, you may be right, we'll find out about Tesla, but there seem to be a lot of investors who are willing to give him more money to do science experiments or whatever he's doing. Yeah. I mean, how much commitment do you have to have as a long short investor? When you go short on something like Tesla, that can get pretty painful. Yeah, look, um, Tesla is one of, you know, many things we have in what we so call, call our bubble basket mm -hmm. of stocks that we just think are mispriced and they're mispriced by huge, huge amounts. And, um, you know, they're sized in a way that gives us the ability to, you know, wait a fair amount of time to be proven right or wrong. I think eventually the, the mood of the market will change. Eventually the company will be called into account to demonstrate profitability. I don't know when that will happen and, and the portfolio is positioned properly relative to the risk and the reward there. 
That was David Einhorn, co-founder and president of Greenlight Capital, speaking earlier with David Weston on Bloomberg Daybreak Americas. T-Mobile is setting the stage for a possible merger with its wireless rival Sprint. T-Mobile executives have been meeting with investors to talk up the potential of tens of billions in savings if a deal happens. Discussions between T-Mobile parent Deutsche Telekom and Sprint owner SoftBank are still at an early stage. Coming up, we will bring you new data on tech's diversity problem and how it's exposing a proposed solution to boost women in tech next. And a reminder of our new interactive TV function. You can find it at TV Go on the Bloomberg. You can watch us live. If you miss an interview, you can go back to it. You can send our producers a message, play along with the charts we show you on air. This is for Bloomberg subscribers only. Check it out at TV Go. This is Bloomberg. Ride-hailing startup Lyft released its first staff diversity report, revealing more women and minorities in technical roles than rival Uber, which presented its demographics in March. Lyft said 18% of its tech workers are women, compared with just 15% at Uber. 11% of Lyft's tech workers belong to a group other than white or Asian. That's almost double Uber's corresponding figure. The inclusion reports come as Lyft has tried to distinguish itself as more welcoming than its larger foe, which has been plagued by allegations of sexual harassment and gender discrimination. Speaking of diversity, when it comes to boosting the number of women in tech, people often point to the lack of women in venture capital, believing that an increase of women in VC would in turn pop up funding in companies founded by women. But a new Bloomberg analysis shows evidence that debunks that hypothesis, finding that firms with senior women partners backing companies founded or co-founded by women at roughly the same rate as firms with no women in senior roles. Joining us now to discuss our Bloomberg Tech reporter, Sarah McBride. So exactly what were the findings here? Well, the findings showed that even though everyone thinks more women VCs would back more women-founded companies, that's not necessarily true. There are some women VCs who back a lot, but overwhelmingly that was not the case. So how did you choose the firms? How did you yeah, it was find tough. the data? It was a big project. Some of this is very closely right. held. <laughs> so what I did was I went to CB Insights and I gathered data on what are the women founded companies that have raised uh, the most money. And also I looked at what are the companies that have um, the venture companies that have had the most unicorn exits in the last five years. So that became my universe of top companies. That means any newer VC firm wasn't included in this study. So then once I had that information, I went and saw how many women partners were at each of those firms and also what their companies they'd backed were at Series A level and above, so not the really small rinky dink mm -hmm. angel rounds and were any of those companies founded by women. And I took a very expansive view, like if they had someone who was a co-founder who maybe wasn't there right at day one or a woman CEO, I would count that too if they could make a good case. Now, one of the most interesting parts of your story to me was some of the comments made by female entrepreneurs right. and also female VCs. Talk first about what uh, some female entrepreneurs had to said about women VCs. Right. Well, I spoke to a bunch of female entrepreneurs who said that many women VCs hold a ton of networking events. There are all these like coffee meetings for women founders and so on. But then when it comes to actually getting investments from women VCs, that's very different. You can network all you want, but that's not the same as getting a check. So they found that when they actually went to pitch women VCs, often women VCs were very tough on them. They couldn't say if they were tougher on men or not, since obviously you mm -hmm. only see your own pitch, but they felt that compared to male VCs, they asked a lot more questions, mm -hmm. wanted a lot more data. And one woman VC, uh, one woman entrepreneur told me she got to the point where she dreaded going to pitch women VCs, which is sad. What about what women investors had to say? Because you know, the, the, some seem to have concerns that if they do fund women, they're going to be perceived as having a bias towards women, right? Right. Some said that. Um, one told me she was worried about kind of being lumped together. Oh, she only backed that um, woman entrepreneur because she's a woman. And look, she really screwed up. So 
they'll kind of write off the entire gender based on one case, which makes it a little easier to back uh, men if you're a woman. And she realized she was subconsciously thinking that and then, of course, wanted to stop thinking that. So this leads me to the next question, which is, you know, is the answer just to get more women in VC yeah, so that they're not do. so isolated, <laughs> right? right? I, think, I still think we need more women in VC, for sure. Whatever the results. Right, because eventually that won't be the result anymore. I mean, and also younger women VCs don't necessarily feel this way. They haven't had to blaze the trail in the same way, so they might not be carrying all the career baggage some of the older women VCs are. One, Jess Lee from Sequoia told me, I think being a woman is a competitive advantage. Mm -hmm. She specializes in consumer businesses, and she thinks that the bulk, because the bulk of consumer decisions are made by women, she has an advantage in understanding the female consumer that many of her male colleagues will never have. Are there any other studies on this? About, about this oh, particular oh, yeah. subject? Absolutely. So there's one study that uh, did a very wide look at you know every VC firm and found that if you look at the overall universe that women VCs were more likely, but that took every rinky-dink firm into account. Okay. There was another one okay. from Penn and NYU. We'll have to leave it yeah. there. Oh, oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Sarah McBride, our VC reporter. Great read. Check it out at Bloomberg.com. This is Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang. We now know Donald Trump is pulling the U.S. out of the landmark Paris climate deal. Reaction has been swift, with many tech leaders decrying the exit from Elon Musk, who announced that he would be departing the presidential council, to Apple CEO Tim Cook and Google CEO Sundar Pichai, expressing disappointment. Joining us now to discuss this and other tech stories that grabbed our attention this week are Bloomberg Tech executive editor Tom Giles and Bloomberg Tech reporter Eric Newcomer. So, Tom, first of all, the tech community and other business leaders quick to express disappointment. You even had Bob Iger also departing the presidential council. What does it mean if these people aren't going to sit at the table with President Trump? That didn't go over well here in Silicon Valley at all. I mean, to what extent was engagement? The idea is engagement gives us, you know, enables us to sway policy, enables us to be part of the conversation. Well, what has it gotten for them so far? I realize it's early days, but he's been pretty active in terms of dismantling some of these protections, regulations that Silicon Valley really, really favored. IBM's Ginny Rometty not leaving yet. Um, Elon Musk, Bob Iger say, forget it, we're done. How much does engagement really buy you in D.C.? And I think so far the answer is not a whole hell of a lot. And President Trump's argument is how much does staying really by the U.S. or matter at all? Take a listen to what the president had to say about his decision. The reality is that withdrawing is in America's economic interest and won't matter much to the climate. The United States under the Trump administration will continue to be the cleanest and most environmentally friendly country on Earth. Eric, you were at the Code Conference this week. A lot of tech heavyweights. This was the talk of the conference. Hillary Clinton was there speaking as well. What did people have to say? Yeah, it was an amazingly uh, political conference. Hillary Clinton was the headliner. Kamala Harris spoke along with Lorene Powell Jobs, who was there to talk about sort of Im her immigration activism. So just overall, I think a lot of people wondering how, you know, trying to understand their disconnect from the rest of America, both culturally and politically. Um, and so I think people are more sort of scratching their heads and then trying to figure out how they could step up, do something, a lot of questions about fake news, you know, how much social media platforms had to figure out how to get the truth to the American people and whether Mark Andreessen then said that was a condescending idea. So. People still trying to figure it out was, I think, the main takeaway. There had been a lot of concerns about the relationship between Silicon Valley and Washington because tech leaders had been so outspoken against the election of Trump to begin with, and you saw them actually going to the table when he invited them to that initial meeting after getting elected, and now here another divide. I wonder what it actually means for the future of the bridge between Washington 
and the Bay Area. Well, I think th I think that bridge is going to start is starting to be dismantled a little bit. You're seeing, you know, look at the statements that you heard from Tim Cook and other leaders over the course of the week. They echo what we're hearing from Germany, France, other parts of the world, which is we can no longer feel that we have this alliance with the federal government in the United States. Macron talks about the federal government versus the Americans. We're with the Americans. So Tim Cook and other business leaders are going to increasingly see themselves as needing to set the tone, be the leaders on issues like environment, like immigration, where they feel a disconnect from D.C. So more uber news this week as Always. every week Always. and number one was the firing of anthony lewandowski the head once head of the uber self-driving car project who came over from google what is the latest that we know so you know uber wanted him to testify in their defense they needed to actually put up a defense they weren't going to sort of be able to use his fifth amendment privilege to protect them in their civil case against alphabet's waymo so eventually he wasn't sort of willing to cooperate with them and produce everything that they needed, so they fired him. And, and that, that puts the, 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 another potential risk for Uber because now they're sort of at odds with somebody who has a lot of information about what they've been doing. Other Uber news that got buried because there was so much <laughs> going on this week. They, the CFO has left. Yes. And or their head of finance. Head of finance Gotham has was left. never officially the CFO. Well, they didn't have a CFO. <laughs> right, right. So he They're very sensitive the about CFO. that. But they're looking okay. for a CFO, yes. So he's, he's gone. And yep. also, we got some new numbers. You got some new numbers about Uber's last quarter. Right. So Uber, again, shared their numbers. This sh they lost. 700 million that's down about 700 million down from like 990 million last quarter so that's for uber a pretty good improvement lower losses uh, than much of last year in the quarter their revenue and i i really think people should look at their non-gap revenue it's too complicated to explain why but like it went from 1.4 billion in q4 to 1.5 billion in q1 which is a sl slower quarter so some seasonality there but 100 million dollars of growth in their in their non-gap revenue Tom? Well, I think the Lewandowski thing was the biggest Uber news of the week until we get the Holder report, right, which okay. is coming in the next few days. Lewandowski, big setback for Uber and its driverless ambitions. He was a big part of why they spent $650, $700 million on auto, right? He's gone. Some of the people who are loyal to him are also walking out the door. Waymo has a chance to, to come further back from the ropes. Last year, really dire straits for, for auto for Alphabet's uh, driverless ambitions. Waymo has a chance to come back a long way now. Amazon crossing $1,000 a share. Didn't stay there, but that happened this week as well. Yeah, everybody loves Amazon right now. <laughs> a lot of people. Um, I mean, I think, look at Amazon is the company everybody loves to love right now. They, they're looking at e-commerce. They still, they're dominating e-commerce. They're killing the retail industry. And there's still a long way to go. I mean, and not just in terms of them selling you stuff, but how they get it to you. Drones, their whole logistics effort. So there's a long way to go on the e-commerce side. Cloud computing, this big emerging business within Amazon. And they seem to be running away with it. Microsoft, Google. Oracle now wants to get into the act and give Amazon a run for its money. And they're so far ahead. And we haven't even talked about hardware, the Echo, uh, and, and the entertainment business that they're <laughs> investing lots of money in. Right. I, I watched uh, Reed Hastings from Netflix talk, talk at Coded, and all he could talk about was Amazon, too, as a potential threat from Amazon Play. And that's not even you know in the, the beginning of the list. So I just think the number of opportunities for Amazon to grow into new lines of businesses and expand Right. It's just so enormous that that's what we're, we're seeing right now. Fred Wilson told me last week it's a ten-legged stool. Even if <laughs> one or two legs goes away, yeah. it's still got eight Who left. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Tom Giles, our executive editor for Tech, uh, Eric Newcomer, who covers Uber for us. Thanks so much. Now, it looks like Uber has another competitor, the autonomous trucking company and autonomous car company, Waymo. The Alphabet spinoff announced it will begin testing self-driving trucks. The announcement comes a year after Uber purchased trucking startup Auto and kicked off its own semi self-driving semi-venture, but Waymo isn't as far along in the self-driving truck, self truck sphere as the ride-sharing giant. The company confirmed that it was only testing one vehicle at the moment and that it was still manually driving it on a public road in order to collect data. Uber, on the other hand, delivered its first shipment in a self-driving freight vehicle last August.
Coming up, Bitcoin has been on a wild ride, surging more than 100% in the last two months. We will dig into the basics behind the cryptocurrency next. And this weekend, Bloomberg T Television, we will bring you our best interviews from the week, including Niccolo Damasi, the COO of Essential, discussing how the company's new phone can break through the crowded smartphone market. Stay tuned this Saturday for the best of Bloomberg technology. This is Bloomberg. Now to a story that's grabbing a lot of attention in the investing world. After taking a bit of a tumble earlier this week, Bitcoin is bouncing back up 6%. As we've been reporting, the cryptocurrency has risen more than 100% in the last two months. But this type of volatility has critics saying the digital currency is showing signs of a bubble. So will this bubble be popped or is Bitcoin on its way to becoming mainstream? Joining us now, Coinbase Vice President Adam White. Coinbase is an online platform that allows users to buy or sell Bitcoins by connecting with their bank accounts. Coinbase is also in talks with potential investors on a new funding round, valuing the company at more than a billion dollars. We'll get to that. But first, you guys don't just deal in Bitcoin, also Ethereum, Litecoin. Talk to me about how the currencies stack up. That's right. So Bitcoin is, I think, the most uh, well-known example of an open or public blockchain, right? It gets a lot of attention and it's got about a $40 billion market cap. What I find really interesting and what we focus on at Coinbase and GDAX, our exchange platform, is that there are actually dozens, if not hundreds, of these digital assets out there. That each one has kind of a unique value proposition and our focus is on helping the public, anyone, really be able to access and interact with these blockchains. Olaf Carlson, we of Polychain, was on the show earlier this week saying that he thinks the market cap of Ethereum will surpass the market cap of Bitcoin in the near future. Would you agree? That's right. I saw him comment on that and both Fred Wilson <laughs> and he agree. Um, certainly Ethereum has a ton of developer interest around it right now. So it has a kind of higher order scripting language so developers can create unique applications and contracts on the Ethereum protocol that they just can't on Bitcoin. That's bringing a lot of attention, a lot of interest, and what's really most important, a lot of real utility to the network. So I, I certainly think it's a possibility. If or when that could happen, I don't know. Some say that Ethereum, you know, it's gone from zero to 10 billion in two years, that if, if you looked at like a startup, it's the fastest growing startup ever. Right. Would you agree with that assessment? There, there's some element of truth there, right? But I think what makes Ethereum and Bitcoin and these open blockchains so powerful is that at the end of the day, they're really a protocol. So they look much more like TCP IP, the kind of the backbone of the internet, or SMTP, what powers email. And from that, it introduces so many opportunities, so many unique business models that beyond just kind of one application of a technology or business, I think it'll introduce whole new paradigms that we're not even aware of. Getting access to these currencies is still difficult for layman i mean h how do you educate yourself on this how do you decide whether or not this is a worthwhile yeah. investment that's that's what we do at coinbase right our goal is to be the easiest uh platform to interact with these open blockchains so for example we use something called the mom test so many times it would be can my mom figure out how to buy a little bit of bitcoin or ether on our platform so what we're out there doing is helping bring things like Bitcoin, like Ethereum, to the public so they can take a little bit of uh, money and buy and interact with this new network. When, though, do you think these cryptocurrencies will be mainstream and how? I mean, what will be the main uses yeah. once, you know, regular people get their hands on it? I mean, we're seeing everything on the Ethereum network. There's um, businesses being built that essentially are creating like a decentralized or distributed version of Dropbox. Mm -hmm. So instead of paying one company to kind of store and manage your data, it's actually a, a collection, a network of people that are hosting their um, extra network capacity and those that are willing to pay for it. So I think we're going to see these happen over time more and more. But I do think we're really going to see um, things like Ethereum and Bitcoin become successful when the average user doesn't know they're using it, right? So when I'm using the internet, I'm not aware of how TCP IP works. I just know I point my browser to a website and I'm there and I'm consuming data. I think we're going to see the same thing happen with these networks that help facilitate value transfer. I've heard companies using Ethereum to fundraise. Is that a trend? Yeah, so we're, we're seeing these things that are known as token generation events or initial coin offerings. They're really just crowdfunding, right? So what they're allowing these development teams to do is take their network, take a little bit of that protocol that, that is used to kind of access and power their network, and then sell it to people that want to kind of 
um, help use it and, and help facilitate the development of it. So we are seeing that happen. Speaking of fundraising, what can you tell us about Coinbase's fundraising that's happening right now? I can't talk too much about it. You know, that's, it's kind of common for companies that are kind of size and scale and growth to receive occasional inbounds from time to time. And that's what we have. So how would you describe investor enthusiasm around Coinbase and the cryptocurrency space? Yeah, I would use the larger definition of investor and look at institutional investors as well. And that's where we're really seeing most of our growth. So on our exchange, we're trading upwards of a quarter billion dollars per day. And most of this trading volume is not coming from retail traders. It's coming from institutions, hedge funds, market makers that look at this new asset class and say, this is a market I want to trade, and they're coming to us to do it. So if you could put your bet on one of the three cryptocurrencies that Coinbase works in, which would you, which would you choose? Uh, well, you know, I think the common investment advice stands that you should never invest more than you're willing to lose. And you should never invest in something you don't understand. That said, what we're trying to do is make all these technologies simple. So I think the best investment strategy is kind of a diversified portfolio of assets. And do you think that they all will survive or that ultimately there will be one winner? It's a good question. I think we're in the early innings right now, right? So this, if we're looking at the internet as an analogy, we're probably 93, 94, right? We're starting to see a glimpse of, wow, this could be a really powerful new technology. Not every new website, right, uh, succeeded. It's gonna be the same for digital assets. By and large, though, the ones that have strong development teams with, with a real use case are going to be successful. All right. Fascinating stuff. Adam White, Vice President of Coinbase, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Coming up, it is one of the most important events of the year for the biggest company on the planet. We will bring you a preview of Apple's Worldwide Developers Conference next. This is Bloomberg. Snap Spectacles are making their way to Europe. The parent company of Snapchat announced it will start selling the glasses in the region at its popular pop-up vending machines as well as online. The device will cost £129 in the UK, €149 Euros elsewhere. The Worldwide Developers Conference kicks off this week, given next week, giving Apple a chance to reveal what it has been up to. While anticipation is growing over the new iPhone set to come out this fall, the tech giant has been branching out into other industries to diversify its product lineup. Here with a preview, Bloomberg's consumer tech reporter, Mark Gurman. So you know all the secrets, Marks. What's <laughs> going to happen on Monday? Well, this is Apple's biggest event of the year. It happens every June. This is the first time that it's in San Jose. Usually they have it up here in San Francisco. Francisco. They're going to talk a lot about their next 18 months. We have this new iPhone coming out in the fall, but this is going to set the stage for the software and services that are going to run on this thing. We're going to see improvements to the iPad for productivity users and business users are really going to like the changes they have in store there. We're going to see new Macs and we might even see this Siri speaker that we reported just hit production. Let's talk about the Siri speaker. What is it going to look like? What is it going to cost? What's it going to make? How, why am I going to want to buy it over an Echo or a Google Home? Apple really wants to differentiate here by selling something that can plug right into its ecosystem. There's a lot of people I'm interested, perhaps you're interested in these speakers, the Amazon Echo, the Google Home. I think they're really cool being able to talk to it. But I use an iPhone, an iPad, and a Mac. Those devices don't play nicely together. So if I want this cool new speaker technology, I have to go to Amazon, right? And then I have this Amazon unit, and I see, oh, Amazon has other hardware. They have their services. And slowly, I start ditching my iPhone, and then my Mac, and my iPad for this new Google or Amazon ecosystem. Apple needs to put a stop to this, and that's one of the main reasons why they have to do this speaker. One of the main things you might use an Amazon Echo for is to order things like paper towels. Are we going to be able to do that on We're this Apple device? Uh, certainly, there's going to be deep integration with the developer community. They'll, they'll probably have an app store or a framework of some sort so people can develop applications and programs they can control with your voice. Last year, they opened up Siri to developers, albeit on a small scale, so things like Uber and Lyft or OpenTable can integrate it with it, so you can make a reservation with your voice or you can order a car with your voice. I wouldn't be surprised to see that Siri framework go to a new level so you can do more with your voice, and this being especially geared towards the speaker rather than the phone. Will we hear anything about Apple's efforts in AI? Well, of course, AI is going to be incorporated. And into we reported this new on that AI chip, mm -hmm. which is going to be a big part of their AI efforts going forward. And I think we'll see more developer integration for AI next week. What about AR? 
AR, that's very interesting. There's, there's two parts of AR here. Apple's building these glasses that we reported on, and that's at least a few years away. But it would make sense if they come out with some AR software or some frameworks for developers in the meantime. It'll be interesting to watch to see if they do that next week. And what about cars? Cars, yeah. You know, that's one of our favorite topics. We report a lot on that. We're not going to see an Apple car drive on stage, but they've been working on this self driving technology. It could be interesting if they tease at it next week, but I would say that's unlikely. It's also this month, the 10th anniversary of the iPhone. We're going to see the new phone operating system. What sort of clues will we get about the new phone coming out this fall? Right, they're not going to show the hardware for it, but like you said, it's the 10th anniversary and they might highlight that at the event given WWDC 2007, 10 years ago, is actually when Steve Jobs said that the phone is going to go on sale on, on June 29th, that's the 10th anniversary. They might play back a video of that or talk about it because the iPhone is so core to WWDC at this point. It's all built around that. Mm -hmm. What will we see in this new iOS? Probably a refreshed user interface, improvements to Maps, iCloud, and of course Apple Music. So there's a lot to look forward to if you're an iPhone user. All right, Bloomberg Tech. Mark Gurman, as always, thanks for keeping us informed. We will, of course, be there on Monday. Bloomberg Television and Radio will have full coverage of the Worldwide Developers Conference kicking off Monday. Tune in for our coverage of all the announcements, reaction, and analysis. And Bloomberg Tech is live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV weekdays, 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. That's all for now. This is Bloomberg.